I'm sitting with Jeremy and Krista Carroll. I uh, started Latitude in 2009 from a trip to Haiti. You're going to have to tell us what happened. Yeah. So at the time, we were living on the Upper West Side of New York. Uh, we had two beautiful kids, and we were loving life. Uh, but at the same time, we felt a little bit empty. We felt like we could be bringing our kids home more of a story. And um, Kristen and I decided after the birth of our son Cole that I would travel to Haiti um, on a mission trip with one of our favorite nonprofits. Um, when, when I went to Haiti, I spent time in the poorest slum in the Western Hemisphere, City Soleil, and I met a kid living in extreme poverty. For the first time, I had seen the depths of poverty and I was inspired through this interaction um, and really knew at that point that I wanted to work as hard for this kid as I did for my own. And um, I went back to New York and shared the story with Krista that we need to do life differently. And she just said, thank God. <laughs> she was ready to do life differently. And I think part of her was like, finally, he gets it. So we opened Latitude 21 days after that first trip to Haiti in 2009. Um, and Latitude is a, it's a creative agency and we believe purpose elevates talent. That when you're working for something greater, your talent is actually multiplied. And we build brands in the marketplace and then we invest 50% of our profits into the developing world. So we're building an engine that builds brands and develops relationships on the business side to serve others around the world every day. Now this sounds really almost too perfect. Uh, goes, has the mission, catches the vision, starts the organization in a very short amount of time, et cetera, but there's gotta be building blocks before this that we're saying, that has you saying, we've gotta yeah. do this differently. Yeah. Uh, dial me back a little bit. What was going on? Yeah, so 2009, we had, had our second baby, and um, we were in our early 30s, and honestly, um, we were just becoming uglier versions of ourselves. Um, we were living to serve ourselves, um, and particularly, um, there was a holy discontent that between Jeremy and I about what our life should be about. And um, it was after he sold the biggest deal of his career, um, and I had said, man, we really need to give thanks to God for this. Like he is just providing, he's so good. And Jeremy said, Chris, I worked on that deal for two years. <laughs> <laughs> and I said- Aren't I awesome? <laughs> Look at me, yeah. aren't I awesome? No. Um, <laughs> Throw it all up in the air and see how much God wants and all the well, rest of it that lands, I'll take that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I said, I think God, it probably has some heavy lessons for us to learn. So oh. we were at this just really, um, point in life where we didn't particularly even like each other much. We were mm -hmm. struggling, um, chasing success so hard that we were so exhausted. And just thinking, you know, we're living our values on Saturday and Sunday with our kiddos, you know, at prayer time at night, and we're keeping them in this box that we take out when it's convenient for us. And even philanthropically, while we had um, had organizations that we loved, we would give out of our excess, not out of sacrifice. And so um, it was really just this rock bottom that we just realized we didn't like who we were becoming, that we called our favorite nonprofit and said, can Jeremy go with you? And um, and then there's messiness when he came home too. Um, while I was thinking, oh, thank God you're getting it and want to be about something bigger than yourself, um, which is what I just felt God calling us to do. Uh, there was some logistics that needed to be figured out too. So he said, we need to quit our jobs. We need to do what we do well, which is business. But I'm not so, hearing we're going to gradually kind of wean ourselves off of, I'm hearing we're cutting here and starting over here. Yeah, Jeremy does nothing gradually, first of all. And he really was haunted that God was calling him today to change his life. And so, and, and I felt the same thing too. Um, However, I had to kind of weigh out that worst case scenario for myself. And so I said, well, that's awesome. We have two kids that we need to feed and we have a house or condo on the Upper West Side that we bought the week before the stock market crashed in 2008. Sure. Yeah. So There's just some logistics. <laughs> and I said, can, yeah. we, yeah. I said, can we pray about it? Yeah. And when I returned from Haiti, I was, I was haunted. And um, from the fact that I really wasn't putting my faith into my everyday, into the workplace. and and into our home. And even though I was a gifted salesperson, I could not possibly sell another account 
when I came back from Haiti. I was handcuffed. And that you're just talking really emotionally, spiritually. I mean, what oh. in what way? I was you... wrecked. Tell was, about your dreams. And one night after I returned from Haiti, I had a dream that I was standing in City Soleil, and there was a man that walked by with a wheelbarrow full of leather, and he asked me if I wanted it, and I said, Yeah, of course, I'd love to have it. And he says, What are you going to do with it? And usually I'm pretty quick on my feet. I just couldn't think of anything. And so I said, you know what, find someone else who can take that leather. And right after he disappeared into the tapestry of shacks and shanties, I, I knew that I could have used that leather to make shoes for every kid in the village. And so in my dream, I went chasing after this guy and I couldn't find him anywhere. And I woke up and I was soaked from head to toe in sweat and I was vomiting and Chris asked me what's going on and I told her. and. And, um, you know, it was at that moment that I just knew, like, we have to do this now. We cannot wait another moment because our actions today impact the lives of people tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And as we're trying to navigate this and we're praying about it, a couple nights later I have another dream that I'm up on stage speaking to an audience of 600 people. And I'm telling them I'm going to quit my job and my wife and I are going to start a new company and we're going to give 50% of our profits to empower humanity. And, and where did you come up with the number 50%? 50% was really born in City Soleil when I met that child there um, in the streets. And I just knew that I and we wanted to work as hard for him as we did for our own kids. It was just and an even so, split. An even split. And so for every dollar we earn, 50 cents yeah. goes to serve the world. And really what it means is that you know we're so blessed to be able to grow up in a place with such prosperity and wealth and the reason we have to move forward in life has so much to do with where we're born so now we can move forward in life and others can move forward as well okay well now let's step back again uh, yeah. you you start this company but uh, you got this place on the upper west side right my guess is property values are, are so I mean it we were underwater like there's we had tried to sell it like nine months prior not even one showing we couldn't our mortgage was worth more than what we could sell it for so oh joy yes yeah, so for, <laughs> yeah. for me it was this um, figure out our worst case scenario so I called my parents and you can take the pressure off at any moment correct I mean at any moment you can kind of say what were we thinking let's go back to where we whatever right. it is we had and take the pressure off but you're choosing to at this moment you're making a decision to kind of walk yeah. in this new direction yeah, yeah, you it's know, a shift from living for this world or living with the eternal perspective and oh. we knew that we are no longer living for this world. What, yeah. what is our responsibility here on this earth? And really it's to get our kids to heaven. It doesn't matter you know, how successful we are, how much money we make, or how much money we save or pass on. It's whether we're gonna live our lives in a way that inspires our children and our friends and our friends' children to seek the kingdom. Yeah, so it didn't really feel like a choice. I don't know, God. So our prayer was always to God, like, make it very obvious your will for our lives because we're kind of dim-witted. And so he faithfully, faithfully answered that prayer and just fully convicted us. And I thank God every day for that because I look back and I think, man, that must have been a tough choice. And it really wasn't. Like, it just, he made it really obvious that we weren't supposed to live um, for ourselves anymore and that we could use business to be a sustainable engine for others. Now we often hear boomerang kids, um, these kids who come back and live with the parents. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you were the boomerang couple. I mean, yeah, and two kids. And, and two, two children. Kids. Where did you go? I mean, how did this work? Yeah. So the, this is a fun story of God's faithfulness. We, um, a few weeks after returning from Haiti, we were praying at the kitchen table and decided after my mom and dad were gracious enough to say we'd love to have you home. So we knew our worst case scenario was luxury compared to most. And so we made this decision at the kitchen table and just to let God lead and that we'd quit our jobs and do this and felt this, this peace of God come over us like you do and you know, you're following as well. And Jeremy's email dinged, and I was like so annoyed that he was looking at his email because I was like, we just gave our lives over to the Lord. Can we sit in that for like a moment maybe? And he looked at his maybe email. Maybe he was calling me on the phone. Right. He looked at his email, and he's like, oh, my goodness, Krista. And I said, what? Our neighbor downstairs, whom we had never met, 
somehow had Jeremy's email and emailed us and said, would you ever be interested in selling your apartment? We'd like to expand ours. And we were just shocked. I mean, his faithfulness was so tangible and so immediate and um, so much more than we ever deserved um, that we were, I mean, just broke into tears. Um, so that was a fun story of how he met us where we were at the moment we stepped into the river. Um, but we did move back into my parents' basement a few months later. We started the business in New York and um, with one, a, a dear friend who came on immediately and and then trained her in and then moved into my parents' basement with our two wow. kiddos. Now, Latitude, just so those who are listening know, it does what? Latitude's a brand and experience design firm. So we can build brands from scratch. We can put brands together that are broken. Um, and we can also build experiences for brands. And currently, you're located where? We're located in Minneapolis, and we have offices in New York and Portland. Okay, so my guess is at some point, Latitude grew. Um, it sounds like it grew exponentially, um, because we're saying 2009, we're just seven years out. Yeah. What has been the growth of Latitude? Yeah, do you want to talk to that? Great. Um, so Latitude has been blessed. We. We believe that purpose elevates talent at Latitude. And when you're working for something greater, your talent is actually multiplied. And so now Latitude is a team of 54 people who uh, build brands in the marketplace every day and experiences for top brands like Adidas, Foot Locker, and Taylor and & Loft. And then we invest 50% of our profits back into the developing world. So every year, we're sending our staff to the developing world, whether it's Haiti, Nicaragua, Colombia, Ethiopia, to walk alongside of some of our nonprofit partners um, so that we can realign with the purpose for our own lives and our lives together in business. Now you said staff, but I've also heard that you also send your clients. We do, we love when our clients join us for the opportunity to meet the developing world and be inspired by it. So we often have our clients um, come and it's really neat to be able to show them the impact that has been made in the world through them doing business with Latitude. And um, it's, it's an incredible experience to see them see firsthand the uniqueness of the model obviously is is eye catching. Are you finding other organizations that are built the same way, or do you find yourself we really are in a place by ourselves at this point? It's really tough to find other companies that are built this way. I believe that we're on the forefront of creating the model and underscoring the purpose for case or the purpose the case for purpose in business and um, helping others to see that um, they might have a potential to do this with their business. You know, so often I think, um, actually we've experienced this firsthand with um, certain programs that I've been invited to be a part of as an entrepreneur, and then um, hit a block where ultimately people are very skeptical that we can grow and sustain a business while giving 50% of our profits away. Um, well, I would argue, um, it is absolutely not a liability, which, to be honest, when I started, when we started the company, I thought it probably would be a liability and I didn't care. We were stupid enough to think that it would work and, and if it didn't or if it limited our growth, who cares? It's what God's calling us to do. Um, but unexpectedly, we've, we've just discovered that actually when you are thinking about the benefit of others outside of yourself and your own bottom line, it actually is beneficial to your company. It's giving your team a purpose beyond themselves to work for every day is a huge benefit. It's an asset, it's not a liability. And um, to direct 50% of our profits to the developing world is, in my mind, not a liability. And I've seen it in, through the last seven years, our growth has, we've been in an amazing growth trajectory. We've been able to acquire amazing talent because people wanna be about something bigger than themselves. So, and where do you draw most of your staff from? I mean, how are they finding out about Latitude? A lot through our social enterprise model that, um, you know, we've been lucky to get um, some uh, limelight in the Minneapolis area just because we're doing life differently and it's, people want to know basement, why. You're out of the basement, obviously. You've, we uh, are. You've moved out of the basement. Yes. just want to make clear in yeah. case anyone was left you there. You yes. Know, so. We are out of our basement, although we did it. I begged my parents to move two houses down, so we're still doing life together. Good for you. But, um, but yeah, so it's an interesting business model that peaks people's interest because people ultimately, I think God created us to be about something bigger than ourselves. And so there's that yearning in our hearts to serve. 
And um, there's not a lot of ways in our modern society to do so unless you're in ministry or nonprofit work. And so we would like to just like redefine that actually business can be a huge, huge vessel for kingdom work. Um, and just realize that we can do God's will through our everyday vocations if we tweak it. 17 countries? Yes. Today. Yeah. Uh, and the purpose in these countries? Do you have one sector mm-hmm. in which you're, you're championing, or is this a broad range of things? Yeah. Go ahead. So we, um, we focus on the developing world and people living in extreme poverty. Um, we do so with three main pillar nonprofit partners, um, one of which is Healing Haiti, which we started with, and they're, pri- they're only in Haiti. Um, we've branched out to partner with Opportunity International, which focuses on microfinance and community development programs, which we are a big fan of. We believe in the entrepreneur. And then International Justice Mission, which focuses on um, human trafficking and bonded slavery, sex slavery. Um, so we've had the privilege of working with these nonprofits in a, in a variety of countries and have really enjoyed being able to travel and meet the people that they're serving. Yeah. And as we've grown our business portfolio, we've grown our non- nonprofit portfolio. So aligning the hearts of the brands that we serve with the people that we serve. When we do work for Ann Taylor and Loft, um, we do work in Bangalore, India, where International Justice Mission does rescues. So, um, because Anne, that's where their because, global supply chain is. Yeah, Ann Taylor, they're making their clothes in Bangalore. They're doing great things in their factories for the women who work there. Um, but we also wanted to enrich the community in a way, um, really so that um, we could celebrate our partnership together. So we do great business, our businesses move forward together, and then we invest 50% of the profits where their heart is uh, near their factories. Now I hear again and again, and obviously you're practicing it, is this value of entrepreneurship. That is a really big thing for the two of you, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Talk yeah, we more be- about that. We believe in the entrepreneur. I grew up in a family of entrepreneurs. My grandfather owned a company for 56 years. And when the company sold in 2005, it broke my heart a little bit. I was happy for them um, that they were that they were free from some of the debt in the company and things like that. Uh, But I wanted my kids to be able to grow up in a business. Um, And so in a lot of ways, by building Latitude, we really recreated my grandfather's company, um, a company which um, had great products, great relationships, and also gave back to the community. Um, We're just doing it now in 2016 as opposed to 1949, so it looks a little different. I think for me, my journey as an entrepreneur really just started with Latitude. I didn't grow up in a family of entrepreneurs. Um, But the vehicle of being able to start my own business with Jeremy um, was, for me, an experience of being able to follow God's call for my life. And so when I think about entrepreneur, you know, entrepreneurship or being an entrepreneur, um, I think of it hand in hand with my ability to follow his will for my life and be a good steward of the gift he's given us in latitude. And I just pray that we continue to obey and follow his will in what it's become. What are the kids saying now? I mean, the kids, uh, I'm sure they were very small in 2009 when a lot of this began to stew. But now they're old enough to yeah. recognize some things. Sure. There's 17 countries. They're, you're, they mm-hmm. see you traveling. Yeah. I'm going to guess you take them with you. So they're seeing that as well. What are they saying back to you? Well, I think we can hit on a lot of different parts of that. Mm-hmm. One, one thing that they struggle with is having a mom who is working mm-hmm. a lot. And she, Krista's had to deal with some tough questions from the kids. Mm-hmm. And my oldest daughter, Macy, she's asked you pointed questions. Yes. Why can't you be like other moms? Why can't you be a normal mom and be home? And, um, you know, we've chosen to do life in this small village of really amazing people in a Christian school. And so a lot of the moms are home. And um, so I've had to use that as a platform to tell her that God really called me to the workplace and that although I would love to be home with her every moment for every moment of the day and every skin knee and every book that got to be read to her. Um, God's calling me for something different and that we need to trust that whatever God's will in, a, for, in our lives is the best version and that he put you in this family for a reason and that the experience of having a mom and dad that work and that we travel together and we have a, you know, an, a different life than your friends, like he's going to use that for his glory. Right. Um, but we took her in, in the midst of the struggle for her as she was nine and just becoming a little more aware. We took all of our kids to Nicaragua last year, so they were one, four, seven, and nine. 
And, and we also took her parents. Yes, so, who have made a lot of this possible, right? Mm -hmm. It's what we all do. We, right. just, we <laughs> take children that young to Nicaragua all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it was a, an amazing thing because we spent a day, we spent 12 days there, but one of the days we were in a school um, of kids, and the school was slightly larger than hers. It was about 300 children. She got to interact with these kids and spend the day with them, Thanks. and it was a school that we have built a few classrooms for and funded some operational costs and such. So we would explain that to her that you know God's will was for us to be a part of this in a small way. And at the end of the day, I was tucking her in, and, and she said, "Mom." you know, that's a lot of kids at that school. And I said, yeah, it is. And she goes, Mom, you definitely should keep being a working mom. And, and it was just amazing because she, God, God gifted her with a vision of how he's using our family and that um, indeed we should trust his version as the best. On that same trip, um, we spent some time going to farms and visiting with um, micro micro agriculturists, mm -hmm. micro farmers, mm -hmm. and um, it was a wonderful day in the field. And I was just wondering what was on my kids' minds. And mm -hmm. as we were tucking my son in, he, seven, he, yeah, he just said, "Dad, that was such a fun day, and meeting Jose was great. And I could see myself being friends with him if I lived here. I just wish I lived here." And he said, you know, he's got his own goat, and he has his own pig, and it's just so cool. And he didn't see the fact that Jose sleeps on the dirt floor and doesn't have water or yeah. electricity. He just saw Even his giftedness. we were in his house having a conversation, and that's the cool thing about these kids experiencing the developing world is they don't have the filters that a lot of us have throughout life, and they see the natural giftedness in everybody. And another night, as I was tucking Cole in, he said, I don't think that... No, he all... said, Dad, you know the bad guys? Yeah. He said, I don't, think, I don't think they're all bad. He said, I just think some people don't have enough. Mm -hmm. and, and it was, it was interesting to get his perspective on how mm -hmm. he saw the world. Yeah. Um, on another trip, I was traveling back from Ethiopia with World Vision, actually, and after he had been away from me for 10 days. He was four and missed his daddy. Yeah, he said from the back seat as we're driving away from the airport, Daddy, what did you do in Ethiopia? And I said, well, I traveled with World Vision and we were looking at their programs and studying their programs, meeting the people who were in the WASH program. And I explained to him a bit about what that's all about. And, and then I said, and we went to another area where they're drilling a well so people will have water. And he said, Daddy, I think you should go to work every day. And that was just a special moment. So, What are we going to see in five years? If we're now having this conversation five years from now, and, you know, in the Lord's wisdom, yeah. may it be, uh, what are we going to be talking about? You know, I feel um, like I pray and I do feel that God wants us to continue to grow our business as in what it is that we do great business we earn the privilege of being able to do um, work around the world but I really feel um, in my heart that God is trying to show the world that he can be used in um, commerce and capitalism and that um, business is an amazing beautiful thing when it's used right and so I feel like we're on the cutting edge of proving the model mm. um, and it, the funny thing is, is I think, you know, God uses the ill-equipped. And um, he, he picked the two of us who were just dumb enough to think that we could do this and not know better and, you know, not know enough to know that we're completely ill-equipped. And so it's clearly him using latitude. It's clearly him. It's not, um, you know, two wise business people that would have been successful regardless. Um, mm -hmm. But I think he is hopefully going to use the model to show other people that trust in him and doing life differently is um, a worthy cause. I think I heard about you in another conversation that we've had here in one of the interviews where they said there was a person that went with the gathering after one invitation on a trip to Haiti with Fred. Is that you? Yeah, that's me. And then you're, this is your first gathering. Right. So, what has this meant to you, to, uh, for the both of you to be here? So last year, a guy came into my office and he said, "Do you know Fred Smith?" And I said, "I don't know. I don't know Fred Smith from the gathering." And he he said, "Well, I'll introduce you." Later that day, 
Fred sent me an email and he asked me to go to Haiti. And since I'd been there 15 times, I figured, why not? If this doesn't turn out, I'll just go visit some other ministries while I'm down in Haiti. And so actually in the Miami airport is where I met Fred for the first time on our way to Haiti two weeks later. And we had a great time and I, I just knew then the gathering community was special and something I wanted to be a part of. And really when I was coming down here, I asked Krista, I said, would you rather be on a family vacation right now or be going to the gathering? And she said, I'd probably rather be on a family vacation. And, and um, as, as we sat um, in the first dinner with Rich Stearns and, and heard about what's going on around the world and with World Vision in particular and some of the uh, tragedies our world is facing, we knew that we were at the right spot, mm. investing in the right way so that we can sharpen our swords and think different about philanthropy, think different about business, mm -hmm. really invest in relationships that are really close to us that we had no idea were there. And so this weekend has been an absolute gift for mm -hmm. us to be able to uh, refocus on each other, on our faith, on our business and our philanthropy efforts. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we're gonna walk out of here stronger for the next, for the next year until it's time again to refocus mm -hmm. with the gathering. Mm -hmm. Well, we're d definitely delighted that we've given the gathering platform to you to talk about this incredible Thank model. You. Incredible model. Jeremy and Chris, it's just a blast to be with you. Thanks for coming and talking with us. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.